Well, I would invite you, uh, if you would, uh, take your Bibles and follow along when we read together uh, from Matthew chapter 19. Let me give you just a little context here of the book of Matthew. Uh, The gospel itself, uh, every gospel has a particular viewpoint. They're, They're all telling the story of Jesus, but each writer is centering in on on some particular aspects of Jesus' life and who he is in this world. Matthew tends to center his whole gospel around the idea that Jesus is the Messiah King, okay? And he has come to reign and to rule. And so Matthew develops that all the way along by giving us the genealogy to prove that he has the pedigree of a king and and then he gives us his birth and, and, and shows the supernaturalness of his birth that, that he would be the king that comes down from heaven. He, he shows us how that the king conquers evil in, in the 40 days in the wilderness. I'm just giving you bits and pieces. And then he tells us about the message of this king in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount. And on and on it goes. He's building this case. Who is Jesus? He's not just a man. He is very God of very God and very man of very man and come to be the king, the Messiah in this world. And so uh, now we're into various encounters with the king here at this particular point in time. And uh, we find one of them this evening here, which we commonly call this account of the rich young man. Uh, Let's... uh, Turn to chapter 19, beginning at verse 16 there, and we will read there uh, to the end of the chapter, going to center on our thoughts on the first part of this uh, text here. Behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then shall be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Will you pray with me? Lord, illuminate our hearts, make us understand, give us wisdom to take in what you want to tell us, to apply it, and to see ourselves here in the Scriptures, so that we may confess you rightly in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this was a young man who had it all. Uh, one of the Gospels makes mention of the fact that he was a ruler, probably a ruler in the synagogue, uh, obviously wealthy. 
there. Uh, he, he would have been a, a popular guy. He would have been someone well known in the community. Uh, he had it going in terms of the culture and life of his day. Everyone would have looked at him and said, he's a successful man. But there was uncertainty in his life, wasn't there? And he comes to Jesus because of that uncertainty. This uncertainty that he has in his life is concerning eternal life. You know, the scriptures tell us in the book of Ecclesiastes that God is set in eternity in the heart of every man. Remember that with everyone you talk to. They may be an atheist and purport to not believe in the living God at all. They may be a Buddhist. They may be a, a Muslim. They may uh, be a, no, a nothing and a nobody. But God says that every man's heart is aware of the fact that eternity is coming, that it's an inescapable condition of a, every human being. They, they wonder about eternity. They know eternity's coming, and they want some reassurance concerning eternity. And that's what this young man wanted. He wanted reassurance. And he came running to Jesus and and in terms of evangelism, you would think, this guy is ready. Okay, uh, One of the other gospel tells us about him that he actually runs and falls down on his knees before Jesus. And he asks the right question. What can I do to have eternal life? So he's coming to the right person at the right place at the right time and even falling down on his knees, and you would think, well, it's time to just pull out the card from the back of your pocket and say a prayer with this guy and uh, have him sign his name at the bottom and uh, enroll him in, in the local church. But that's not what happened there. In fact, when, when, when Jesus doesn't, doesn't just say, okay, brother, here, pray this prayer. Receive me into your heart and, uh, and join with me. Why doesn't he do that? Well, because what we understand from Jesus is that he is not only the king, but he sees all things. You remember that story from the Gospels about Nathaniel, how he saw him under the fig tree even before uh, if Nathaniel knew anything about Jesus, our Lord sees, and so he sees something in this rich young ruler's heart that isn't quite right. And so instead of saying, like he did to the early disciples, Peter and, and John, just come follow me, he begins to say, well, you need to do the commandments. And he cites, by the way, the easiest commandments. You know, not that any commandment is easy in and of itself, but you have the first part of the law which talks about God and, and the Sabbath and all those things. And then you have the second part which is more relational about our human brothers and sisters, the people around us. And he starts taking off these commandments. Why does Jesus do that? Because he's wanting to lay the finger on the heart of this man. And nothing does that more than pressing the, the law of God. You remember Paul in the book of Galatians says to us that the law was given as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And so he takes, uh, he, he, he uses this if we would say it, method of evangelism on this man, and he begins to, to cite all the commandments. And he says, all you got to do is keep these. And what was his response? An astounding response. He said, sure, I've done all those things. 
Now what does that tell us about the, the heart of this rich young ruler? It tells us, one, he has no real grasp of the holiness of God, does he? He has no real grasp of the depth of the law of God. If he can say that he's never lied and he's never done anything wrong, he's kept all these things, he's got a problem in his heart, you see. And that's why Jesus isn't just welcoming him in because first he has no conception of the goodness and holiness of God. Now, he had, he had uh, implied that earlier in the text there. When this ma young man came to Jesus, he said to him uh, this, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Already he's trying to point him away from himself to the holiness of God. And I believe too, beloved, uh, with that language, he's also trying to, to say to this young man, you don't realize who I am yet either. Because you flippantly call me good. And if I was a mere man, you could never do that. To really truly call me good, you must realize that I am also God here in the flesh. So though this man seems to be ready to be converted, he isn't. Why is that? Because there's no repentance in his heart. Not a, not a sign of repentance at all. By the way, you'll notice, and, and I didn't point this out yet, but kids, did you notice which commandment that Jesus didn't say? Did your parents teach you the Ten Commandments? What's the very last one? Do not covet. Do not covet. And the very commandment which we'll see here in this text, which he was, was in love with breaking, Jesus didn't say that to him. But he's going he's gonna to point it out to him later in this chapter here. But you see, there's no repentance. Now, I think this is important because we live in a day, especially in evangelicalism, beloved, where it's easy come, easy go when it concerns Jesus. We sometimes call it easy believism. Just walk down this aisle here and, or raise your hand in the pew over there. I see you, I see you. And come and sign a card and, and you're, you're in. You've been born again. But we see that the scriptures, when it talks about being born again, talks about having a heart of repentance, a sorrow for our sins. You see, belonging to Jesus isn't just like just joining a club where you just pay your dues and, and you join. Belonging to Jesus comes with his terms. And his terms are, I am the holy God. And you must turn from yourself. You must be, repent of your sins if you wish to enter into my kingdom. And we see no sign of that on the part of this young man. So he digs a little deeper into his life there. And he says there in verse 21, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Well, there's two things there in that verse, at least two. The first one is he's pointing out his, one of his great problems. And God does that to people when he's bringing them to conversion. He lays his finger upon their sins. He points to them and says, this is where you're wrong. And he, he's pointing at this rich young man and he's saying, you are covetous to the very core of your being. Now there's nothing wrong with having money, beloved. Think of Abraham, wealthy man. God never condemns him for his wealth. Solomon, probably one of the richest men the world's ever seen. 
God, that was a blessing of God. So it's not that, that money in itself, whatever particular amount of money we have, is, is evil in and, of, in and of itself. But the Apostle Paul tells us the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. So it wasn't just that he had all this money, but he loved that money. And he was unwilling to part with it. Now he, he thought he had good reason for that. Because the rabbis of his day actually taught that it was a sin to give more than 20% of your money away. You're, you're, you're crazy. If God has given you all this money and you give more than 20% of it away, you're, something's wrong with you. So he thought on his own religious grounds and backgrounds that this request of Jesus was wholly unreasonable. Give everything away? Well, what does Jesus mean? I think he means this. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 14 and verse 33. Luke 14 and verse 33. In Luke 14, 33, we read these words there. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, what? Cannot be my disciple. You can't do it unless you renounce everything that you have. Well, that's pretty strong language, Jesus. You're demanding that you become my absolute master and Lord. That I give my entire life and my entire being and my entire everything to you. Yes. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You see, he demands repentance for sins, but he also demands that he be the king, the Lord of our life. Now, that doesn't mean... There weren't, this, this is probably the only record we have in the Scripture of Jesus saying, sell everything and come follow me. He doesn't do, just go around doing that as a matter of course. But you see, he's, he's laying his finger on the problem in this man's life. And the problem was not only he was lacking in repentance for his sins, but he was also unwilling to have Jesus be his master. But you know what, beloved? That's what it means to be a Christian. Not only the repentance of our sins, but the acceptance of the fact that Jesus is your absolute King and Lord. And therefore, He has a right to demand everything from you. Your entire life, not just 15% or 25% or even 95% of your life, he has the right as your Savior and as your Lord to demand 100% of you and 100% of your talents, 100% of your gifts, 100% of, of your treasures even if he wants them. That's real Christianity. That's what Jesus says is to be a disciple. It's not some add-on thing. It's not some easy believism. It's your entire being being given over to him. Now, I don't know what he's... A lot of times we don't even know this when we become a Christian the first time. You know, we're, we're not aware of this. But it is a reality and we, we, need, we need to grow into this reality too. We grow into the reality of that Jesus is not only my Savior who forgives all my sins, but He is also my Lord. And therefore, He may demand of me anything. He may ask of me anything. 
Now, I don't know what he's asking of you tonight. Some of you have something in your mind already this evening. The Holy Spirit suddenly pointed something out to you and said, you know what? You've been willing to serve me and, and, and love me in this and this and this way, but right over here, you're holding back. You're saying, well, I don't want you to be Lord of that particular part of my life. But he's going to bring you to that because that's who he is. He's your king. Now, we have no worries when that happens. See, he was worried, of course, and this is, this is the sad part of the text that uh, uh, Jesus tells him, Go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And then the sad words in verse 22. Then the young man heard this. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. See, his self-sufficiency was enough for him at the end of the day. He just wanted a band-aid on his life. He wanted some sort of comfort about eternity he wanted jesus to say a few words to him so he could go home and feel good about himself but he didn't want jesus at the end of the day and to be a true christian we need to want jesus more than anything more than life itself more than wealth more than family, he, he refers to all these things, more than family, more than houses, more than lands. Now, I'm not saying God is telling you to go sell your house today, so don't get the pastor wrong tonight, you know. He rarely does that, although he does that in some people's lives. You remember the famous missionary C.T. Studd who, who lived in a palace, what we would consider a palace, this like 50-room mansion in England and he sold it all and he went to China for 10 years and preached as a missionary in China and then he went to India for six years after that and then he went to Africa after that and he ended up his life living in a straw hut in the middle of Africa and he actually dies out there and his wife, he saw her for two weeks in 20 years. Now, I'm not recommending that, but this is what he did, you see, because he was following Jesus. Jesus was his Lord, not just his Savior. He was Savior and Lord all in one, which is what we are as Christians. And he said to his God, his Savior, whatever you want, Lord, I will give you. Even if it means the palace is gone. And by the way, he was a world famous sportsman. He would have been a professional sportsman at the beginning of this. He was, we don't know much about cricket in the U.S., but it's a big thing over there in some parts of the world. And he was the top man. You know, he had done a hundred, whatever that means. I can't, I, I still don't know that, what that means today. But he gave that all up, you see. Because his Lord was calling him. And we need that same sort of attitude there. Otherwise we go away sad because we live in our own self-sufficiency. And then we have to ask ourselves, are we really Christians? If we depend upon ourselves and not upon the living God. And so he went away sad. Well, that shocked the disciples because, I mean... Here's a guy, he looked like the candidate of the week, if not the month or the year, to add to the church roles. But his heart wasn't right. See, beloved. Well, what about us? Now, I'm getting into another sermon already, but that's all right. We have a little time, all right? You'll, you'll forgive me, right? I usually don't preach too long. Let, and I'm not coming back next Sunday, so. What about us? Okay, the disciples said, well, we've given up everything to follow you. What's going to happen to us? Well, he says this to him. He says, look, in verse 
20, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. He says, don't worry about it. If that rich young man would have sold his fortune, whatever it was, and given it away, who was going to take care of him? Well, Jesus said, I'll take care of you because, because now you're depending on me and I am the God of the universe and I have everything. And furthermore, he says, my people will take care of you. You give up your house, you give up your land, you give up what's precious to you, you think God returns that back to you. And it, just think of it. Now you're not just self-sufficient, your own little island. You belong to the family of God, and they will all take care of you. We had a, a family visit our church last week from Missouri. They didn't worry about coming up from Missouri because there was another Christian family that was going to take them into their home and take care of them the whole time that they were there. And if you've ever been around the world, wherever you go, you will find Christians. And those Christians will take you in. And they will care for you and care about you. You see, why would you just be self-sufficient in your own little huddle there when you have the assets, essentially what Jesus says, of all of my people everywhere in the world. Isn't that more than what you're asked to give up? It is. It is. So cast yourself upon the Lord, not only in repentance, but believe that he is your master and your Lord, and whatever he demands, he, you give that to him tonight and he will take care of you you will find suddenly that you have a hundred brothers and sisters a hundred houses a hundred pieces of ground the lord of the universe your king he he will take care of you don't be like this foolish rich young man who clung to everything but in the end, lost everything. Because what did he lose? Eternal life itself. Let's pray. Father in heaven.